Okay, this is uh, the midterm two from spring 2022 for MA 265. So we're asked to find which of the following statements aren't always true. And in the first statement, we have these three linearly independent vectors. And we're trying to see if this linear combination of these vectors are also going to be linearly independent. So remember that if something is linearly independent, that means that it satisfies this relation, where if you have some scalar multiplied by one vector plus another scalar multiply the other one, etc. Um, that equals zero, zero vector. Uh, this is only satisfied when c1, c2, and c3 all equal zero. So in the case of this, we can also apply the same test, and I'm just going to use different um, constant or scalar notation. Or not notation, just the letter. Anyways, um, you have d1 times u plus v plus d2 times v plus w, what's supposed to be v, plus d3 times w. And then if this, if these three vectors are linearly independent, that that means that the uh, scalars must be zero for this equality to be satisfied. So we can kind of rearrange this expression um, because of the like vectors. So we have d1 u plus d1 plus d2 v plus d2 plus d3 w equals zero. And based on this, these two expressions are pretty much the same except for different constants out front. So notice that this, this d1 maps to this c1, which we know is zero. So if this is zero, then this is zero, then this must be zero, and then this must also be zero. So then d1, d2, and d3 all equal zero. And so that means um, this test for linear independence is satisfied, so this statement is true. Um, part B, we have every linearly independent set of vectors, and some vector space has at most n vectors, where n is the dimension of the vector space at well, as well. So this is true because if you think about it, um, the basis for Rn will consist of n vectors. Um, and so you have these, you know, n vectors, and if you have more than n, you will be able to write um, at least one of these vectors in terms of um, the base, as a linear combination of the basis vectors. So at most it, contain, it can contain n vectors for it to retain its linear independence. So this is true. Um, and then C, every spanning set of Rn contains a basis of Rn. Um, this makes sense because if you're trying to span this vector space, um, you're going to need to have um, a basis that will cover all the possible vectors in R to n. And so the basis will span the entire vector space. And so this is true. So in this case, we're having a question if the nullity is zero, then if this linear system will have a unique solution for every b, um, b vector. So this means that the nullity means that the dimension of the null space is zero, and the null space of A is zero. Um, and so this kind of reminds us of the rank nullity theorem, where you have if the rank of A plus nullity of A is equal to the number of columns in A. Um, so this is zero from the question, and the rank is also equal to the number of pivot columns uh, in A. And so from this, we know that the number of pivot columns equals the number of columns in A. So we can kind of think about different matrices. So we can have, you know, this M by N matrix where you have more columns than rows. But this scenario is actually not possible because if you think about it, there's the number of pivot columns would be restricted by this dimension here, but you have more columns then you could have pivot columns, and so this equality would not hold. So this is actually not a possibility,
But if, say, you have something like this, where you have more rows than columns, um, if you have maybe, like, let's just do a 3 by 2 matrix. So you could have, you know, your pivot uh, columns here. But you have... Sorry, okay, so you have this, th these pivot columns here, so you have two pivot columns and you have two columns, so this equality is satisfied, but um, you have this kind of extra column here that if you do this multiplication, say, by x1, x2, you get this situation. Um, sorry, I forgot to add these. Okay, so if you if you have this matrix here, um, you're going to be restricted by the zero right here in that you won't be able to cover all the possible vectors, all the possible three by one vectors because of this zero right here. So for example, if you had a matrix like two or something, zero, zero, two, you wouldn't be able to have a solution for that matrix. So you don't have a unique solution for every B just because the nullity is zero. Um, so this statement is... The one that's not always true. Um, this would be actually the case though if it was a square matrix, but um, in this case, if you have a m greater than n matrix, it's not. So, the last part, is, so we know the answer is d already, but we can still check e. So, the rank of a 6 by 4 matrix can be between 0 and, and 4 inclusive. So, a 6 by 4 matrix is Something like this. Okay, that's a little too many. Okay, whatever. Okay, so now we have the rank right being the number of pivot columns that are possible, and so the number of pivot columns right obviously cannot exceed the number of columns. Like the maximum number of pivot columns is equal to the number of columns, which you can actually verify from this rank nullity theorem because the maximum can be is when the nullity is equal to zero. So your number of pivot columns can be at most four, which is the number of columns. And you can also have no pivot columns if you just have a bunch of zeros, if you just have a zero matrix. So this is true. And yeah, so that's this problem. Okay, so in this part we're asked to find the dimension of a subspace that consists of the A that satisfies this commutative uh, equality. So maybe a easy thing to think about is just like imagining that this A vector is A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, and then just actually doing this multiplication out. So when you do that, we get uh, 1 times A times 0, 0. So this is the right hand side. So, wait, that's definitely not right, okay. Um, A, B, C, 2D, 2E, 2F, 3G, 3H, 3I. So that's on the right hand side, and then on the, oh, my bad, this is the left hand side, okay. Uh, but on the left ha right hand side, <laughs> um, you have A, 2b, 3c, and then d, 2e, 3f, g, 2h, 3i. Okay, so these need to be equal. Um, so right away you can see that for c to be equal to 3c, c has to be 0. So that's done. This is also done. So c equals 0, f equals 0. Um, for b to equal 2b, this has to be 0. Um, for 2d to equal d, also same thing. Same thing with g and h. So basically everything is 0 except for a, e, and i. Um, so you're left with a um, 0, 0, so in the end, a would be equal to a, 0, 0, 
oops, not D, 0, E, 0, 0, 0, I. So these are the only non-zero values in um, the A matrix. And so actually you can write this multiplication, um, this, or sorry, this matrix A as 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 times A plus E times 0, 0, 0. And as this, so the so these matrices right here are the basis for all the a that satisfy this equality right here, and so that means that you have a dimension of three because there are three um, matrices that comprise of a. So the answer is C. So in this question, I'm trying to figure out which numbers A will we have 2 as an eigenvalue. So recall that an eigenvalue is just some scalar where if you have AX equals lambda X, uh, this equality is satisfied. So when we move things over, we have this A minus lambda I times X equals 0. And so uh, we want this to be satisfied um, for... We, we want this expression to have infinite solutions and in that it would be satisfied no matter what a or x is. So because of that, we're going to want this this to be not invertible. Because if it's invertible, you would have a unique solution um, and we don't want that. So here, we if it's not invertible, we have a determinant of a minus lambda i being equal to uh, 0. So if it is invertible, then this would have to be not equal to 0, just based on the properties of invertibility. Um, so because of this, that's where we get our solutions for the eigenvalue. So that's kind of a tangent, but uh, I think it's kind of cool. So we start off by trying to find the eigenvalue. So we do a minus lambda i, so a minus lambda i is 4 minus lambda, 0, 0, 0, negative 2, negative 1 minus lambda, 0, 0, 10. So we have something like this. And this is the determinant of this. So we can do cofactor expansion. I'm going to pick this row to do it along. So we get 4 minus lambda times. So I'm just going to, because these, because these are all zeros, I'm just not going to consider them. So now we just have this to take the determinant of, and then that is negative 1 minus lambda times. Now, because these are zeros, I can just eliminate this row and this column, and then take the determinant of this, which is just 6 minus lambda times... 3 minus lambda minus a squared. Okay, so it's kind of ugly, but that's okay. So 6 minus, let's expand this out. Um, so 18 minus 9 lambda plus lambda squared minus a squared multiplied by this. Um, okay, so, wait, 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 4 minus lambda times negative 1 minus lambda, now multiplied by this expression here, which is lambda squared minus 9 lambda plus 18 minus a squared. Okay, so this is equal to 0, right, because we have this determinant equal to 0. Um, so obviously you can see that 4 and 1 are eigenvalues, but we don't really care about this because the problem is asking for 2 to be an eigenvalue. So we know that this expression must be lambda squared minus 9 lambda plus 18. A squared must be factored into 
some um, lambda to get lambda is equal to 2. And so what we can do is we can just plug in 2 in here. So you get 4 minus 18 plus 18 minus a squared um, would be equal to 0 because if you plug in lambda equals 2 then right when you factor it out it should be equal to 0 based on this expression here. So when you do that you get 4 minus a squared equals 0 so a can be 2 or negative 2. So your answer is going to be E. Okay, so we, in this problem we have two similar matrices, A and B, and we're trying to figure out which statements are true. So in this case, similar matrices, remember, this means that um, there exists some invertible matrix P that uh, P inverse times A times P equals B. And yeah, uh, so then for part one, we have A and B have the same characteristic polynomial. This means that, right, the characteristic polynomial is the matrix minus the eigenvalue times the identity matrix. And so we're trying to, s and this statement is asking if this is true. So the determinant of A minus lambda I is equal to the determinant of B minus lambda I. So one thing to note about similar matrices is that the determinant of A and B are the same. And you can quickly prove this by doing determinant of P inverse times determinant of A times the determinant of P, and that equals the determinant of B, just based on determinant properties. And similarly, you can see that the determinant of P inverse times the determinant of P is just going to be 1, they cancel. So the determinant of A equals the determinant of B. So thus, if the, they have the same characteristic, poly, characteristic polynomial, we want to check if A minus lambda I and B minus lambda I are similar. Because if they're similar, then they will thereby have the same characteristic polynomial. Um, so let's check that A minus lambda I and then B minus lambda I similar. And that to do that, we need to make sure that we're going back to our definition here of the similar matrices. And uh, yeah, so to ensure that it's similar, then we want to have some equality, right? Such that, you know, there's some P inverse times, you know, maybe like A minus lambda I. I'll call this P1 just to distinguish it from the other P matrix times P um, is equal to B minus lambda I. So this is kind of what we're trying to prove that there exists some matrix P1 that some matrix P1 that is also invertible that satisfies this inequality. So first thing we can do is we remember that because A and B are similar matrices, we have this property already. So we can put that in for b minus lambda i. So b minus lambda i equals p inverse a times p um, minus lambda i. And in this case there's kind of a tricky manipulation we can do where we want to factor out something right to get it in this form. So when we factor that out, we get, um, sorry, we're not factoring it, but we're going to replace this identity matrix with um, a P inverse times P. So this is done because that way you can see we can factor out the P inverse and we can also factor out the P. So when we do that, we do P inverse times A I'm going to keep the P here for now, and then we do, yeah, so when we factor out the P inverse, we get this, and then we do P inverse, and we factor out the P, and remember that P goes on this side because of how matrix multiplication works. 
So we can get a minus lambda i. Um, always remember that there's a identity matrix because um, you have a matrix minus a matrix. You don't want a matrix minus a scalar, which would just be lambda. And then, yeah, voila. So we get this equality. So we have b minus lambda i equals p inverse times a minus lambda i times p. And this is exactly the form of the form of the, this definition that we had asserted earlier. And so this means that uh, b minus lambda i and a minus lambda i are similar, so they will have the same characteristic polynomial because they will have the same determinants. So this statement is true. Okay, so in this statement we have that if the columns of a are linearly independent, then zero is an eigenvalue for a. Okay, so the first thing to note is that a is an n by n matrix, and the columns are linearly independent. So from this, you can gather that A is an invertible matrix. And this is because um, if you have linearly independent columns and your matrix is n by n, which is square, you're, you're going to have a pivot value for every single column. Um, and so that means that you're going to have a unique solution for all values of Ax times Ax equals b. Um, where b is some vector in the r to the n vector space. So based on that, we can say that it, a is invertible based on definition. And also by definition, uh, for an invertible matrix, the determinant of whatever matrix it is must be equal to, uh, must not be equal to zero. Okay, and then the other thing is that zero is an eigenvalue of a. Um, so what does that mean? Basically, remember that the, when you're trying to find eigenvalues, you first find the characteristic polynomial, which is that the, t the determinant of a minus lambda i, and that equals zero. So when you're trying to find the eigenvalues, you would solve this equation for lambda. Um, so if we know zero is an eigenvalue, then we can say it's a zero. So that means the determinant of a equals zero. And that is inherently wrong because we already established here that since we know the determinant of a can't be zero because a is invertible, you can't have an eigenvalue being zero here because otherwise that would break this rule. So this statement is false. Okay, so in this problem we have if a is diagonalizable, then all eigenvalues of a must be non-zero. Um, so first of all, a diagonalizable matrix means that um, you have some, this equality is satisfied, where you have A equals P times D times um, P inverse. Alright, so essentially the D is a diagonal, diagonal matrix, which means that it only has um, non-zero values on the diagonal, so everything else is zero. And then P is some invertible matrix. And if you wanted to write it the way that we've been writing it above with the uh, A and B, you could also write this as D equals um, P inverse times A times P. So first of all, we have this equality here that we know is going to be true because we're given that A is diagonalizable. And then we're saying that all eigenvalues of A must be non-zero. The way I think about this uh, is that, I don't know, this statement just kind of seems weird to me, and so I can't really think of a good reason why the eigenvalues would have to be non-zero um, conceptually, and so the way that I approached this was just to literally come up with counterexamples and play around with the numbers. Um, if there is a better way to think about this, please let me know, but this is just the way that I approached it. So the first thing that I was thinking about was... Um, you want, if, if A is diagonalizable, you must have this satisfied, where you have, for example, um, you have an invertible matrix P, and you must also have a diagonal matrix D. So once you have those two, then A would exist and it would be diagonalizable by definition. So I picked uh, P to be the identity matrix because it just makes all our lives easier and that, you know, 
the in inverse of the identity matrix is the identity matrix. So you would just have one zero zero one on this side. And then we're going to come up with a diagonal matrix that actually does have a non-zero eigenvalue. So this means that, first of all, as a diagonal matrix, you have zeros in the off diagonals. And I'm going to say that this is zero, and then this is like two for a second. For a second. Um, essentially, in, in a diagonalizable matrix, the diagonal entries are going to be your eigenvalues. So... In this case, I'm saying that 0 and 2 are eigenvalues. When I multiply this out, I obviously just get 0, 0, 0, 2 because it's an identity matrix, although you can just multiply it out and see for yourself if that's the case as well. So, voila, we have this A that exists, and we did have a 0 eigenvalue, but it was okay because... Um, yeah, okay, so even though we were able to have a 0 eigenvalue, we still were able to get an A matrix that satisfies this. And if you really wanted to check, you could do, you could use this. And so we could do D, which is 0, 0, 0, 2, as said before, time, or is equal to P inverse times A. And we can check if these two actually equal. So P inverse times A, which was 0, 0, 0, 2. And then one zero zero one, and yeah, this checks out that these two are equal. So we can confirm that this statement is false and that we can have a zero eigenvalue. Based on this, we can actually eliminate some options. So um, we can eliminate the ones with two and three in it. So this and this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. In this part, we have that if negative lambda is an eigenvalue of a, then lambda to the fourth is an eigenvalue of b to the fourth. So we know that from statement a, or statement one, that a and b have the same characteristic polynomial. So this means that they will have the same eigenvalues. And so we know that if negative lambda is an eigenvalue of a, then negative lambda is also an eigenvalue of b. So now we can use this, um, oops, we can use some uh, of our knowledge about eigenvalues, and eigenvalues are essentially values that allow for this equality to happen, so for example, bx equals lambda times x, <coughs> and if you multiply this by b of, on both left hand sides, you will get something like this. And you can write this this part as lambda times b of x. But we know that b of x is equal to lambda times x. So you just get lambda squared x. And so from this, you can see that b squared times x equals lambda squared times x. And so by default, that means that b to the 4 times x equals lambda to the 4 times x, where lambda is some eigenvalue. And that means that if you have your original eigenvalue being negative lambda, then negative lambda to the 4th equals lambda to the 4th, which is an eigenvalue for um, b to the fourth. So this statement is true. Um, now our last one. Oh, actually, I guess you can already figure out the answer from this, but um, because one and four are definitely true, so it must be d. But we should go through the last part anyways, so we have an idea of what's going on. Okay, so if A is diagonalizable, then B is diagonalizable. For A to be diagonalizable, remember that it needs to satisfy this kind of situation. And we also know that um, A and B are similar, so it must satisfy this equality. So we have 
two things. Okay, so I'm gonna. Okay, I'm gonna write it over here so this will separate off everything else. Um, so first we know that b is equal to p inverse times a times p. We also know that um, a is diagonalizable, so we can write a as some other invertible matrix. I'll just call it label it p a times a diagonal matrix that whose diagonal comprises of the eigenvalues of A, and then times PA again. Um, and so remember that PA for a diagonalizable matrix will be comprised of the eigenvectors. Um, and then this will have the information with the eigenvalues. Okay, so we have these two pieces of information, and what we want to do is say that B can also be written in some term where you have PB inverse times some diagonal matrix, I don't know why I add parentheses, uh, P inverse times some diagonal matrix times PB, and this is our goal, to write B in terms of that, to prove that it is also diagonalizable. So. First off, I'm going to call this equation 1 and equation 2. So we can write equation 2 as if we multiply um, by PA on both sides and then by P inverse on the right hand side, you get PA times PA inverse, or PA times A times PA inverse equals the diagonal matrix. <coughs> and then you can do the same thing for the uh, the first equation where we can write A as P times B times P inverse. And now what we can do is we can plug in for A this equation here. So we get D equals P A times P B P inverse P A inverse. Okay, so now we see that we kind of have something close to this, but we're kind of restricted by these two things on the left and right of... That is not a negative one. Okay. So we're restricted by these two things. So we want to make this into some PB and PB inverse. And what you can do here is use um, this inverse rule where, for example, if you have a b inverse, that will equal b inverse a inverse. And just as an exercise, it's good to um, see where this came from. So, right, if we can imagine that you want to have some a b times something, say some in a, B inverse, right, and that should give you the identity matrix. But to do this, you would need to do A, B times B inverse, right, which would give you 1, and then these two would give you just the identity matrix, and then you have to multiply again by A inverse to get the identity matrix. And so that means that this is equal to this. Um, so that's where this, this comes from. Anyway, so now that we have that, you can see that PB is equal to PA times P, and then PB inverse, which is P inverse times PA inverse. So if you kind of flip that around, right, based on this, so like B in this case would match with um, P, so then you would just have PA times P inverse. So that's great because now we do, we can confirm that um, D equals P A times P uh, times B times P A P inverse. And then when you move everything to the other side so that you're solving for B, um, you get P A times P inverse times D 
times P A times P and this will give you the exact form that you want here and so then because of this you can confirm that yes there exists some matrix D and an invertible um, matrix we called it PB over here but PA times P such that this equality um, is possible so because of that this means that B is diagonalizable um, and then the statement then is true is true so our answer is D okay so this question is talking about the vector space of polynomials with degree at most three um, and it's asking which of these subsets are subspaces. So, first of all, the main thing to remember here is that um, to the requirements of a subspace is that um, your subset will include the zero vector, and that it is also closed under scalar multiplication, which means that if you have Oh, that came from okay. Uh, that means if you have v that is you know located in you know a vector space of some of some sort, then that also means that any scalar multiplication times that is also in this vector space. The other thing is that it's closed under addition. So if you have two vectors like a or b, um, and they're located they're in within the vector space you know r to the n or polynomial vector space whatever um, then a plus b is also in that vector space so these are the rules that we should follow um, when assessing if these are subspaces or not so in the first one we're going to find the vectors in r3 that this expression holds so the first thing you notice is that um, this you will never be able to get the zero vector as um, you never be able to have a vector that's all zeros because otherwise this is does not hold. So in this case, if this is if these are all zeros, then you get zero equals one, which doesn't make sense, right? Um, so this set actually doesn't include the zero vector, so it is not a subspace of R three. The second one is the set of all vectors such that um, this equality holds. Um, and so, first of all, you can move this to the other side and just get 10x minus 2y minus z equals 0. And this does include the 0 vector, right? Because if you plug in x, y, z equals 0, then you do get the satisfied equality. So we can check the first um, requirement. The other one is that it's, scaled, uh, it's closed under scalar multiplication. So if instead we had... Is cx, cy, cz. Okay, that is not visible. cx, cy, cz. Um, then this equality will also hold. And so if we do that, we do c times x, c times, if we plug in cx here, and cy, and cz, where c is a scalar, or you could just factor out the c and you would still get this equality, so it would still be satisfied. Um, and then the last one is that it's closed under scalar, uh, not scalar, it's closed under addition. So in this case, say you have x1, y1, z1, and x2, y2, z2. So a plus b would be x1 plus x2, y1 plus y2, and z1 plus z2. And you can check that this will satisfy this expression by plugging it in. But just, I'll write it over here, but 10 times x1 plus x2 minus 2 times y1 plus y2 minus z1 plus z2 equals 0. So we know that individually x1, x, x1, y1, z1, and x2, y2, z2 already satisfy this condition because they're, they're already within this subset. So... Because of that, when we just do the distributive property here, we'll just end up getting 10x1 minus 2y1 minus z1 plus 10x2 minus 2y2 minus z2 equals 0. And these will are already going to be 0 because of 
um, the fact that they're already inside the subset, so these two are zero. So this equation is satisfied. So this is closed un under um, addition. So this is a subspace. This is good. Uh, from that, okay, we can actually only just eliminate one, but that's okay. So for this one, we have that the degree of P of T has to be three. So this is kind of like the requirement that we're trying to fill. So if we just imagine P of T being something like A T Q plus B T squared plus C T plus D. Um, in general, it would kind of makes sense that the zero vector would happen so that this would eventually somehow be equal to zero. Or not zero vector, just um, zero value. So because the general kind of graph for cubics is something like this. So something like that would be obviously crossing the zero. So it would include the zero um, value. And so we can kind of say that the first condition is satisfied. Um, if then we try the closed under scalar multiplication, um, if you have some polynomial, you know, like this, and then you multiply it by some other scalar e, then this is still satisfied because you still get a degree three polynomial because it's just e times a times t cubed and everything else is also just multiplied by e, so the degree is still three. So that's fine, but uh, when we think about scalar addition, it's a little bit, it could be tricky because say you have some um, polynomial t cubed plus one or something, and that's one of your polynomials, and then your other one is negative t cubed plus t squared or something. If these two both have degree three, so this is fine. They're both within the subset. But when you add them together, you get t squared plus one, which does not have um, a degree three. So it's not closed under scalar, not scalar, addition. So this is not a subset, or a subspace, sorry. Uh, so that means we can eliminate this one. Oh, we can actually limit all of these. Okay, so now we just have A as our answer, but we probably want to just look at this one just to make sure we understand what's going on. So the set of all polynomials that satisfy P2 equals zero. So this is good because we have the zero value, so our first condition is satisfied. The second is, is it's closed under scalar multiplication. So if we do C times P2, um, we would still get c times zero, which is just zero, so this is also satisfied. And the other one is um, this condition, again, that p2 is equal to zero, is the one that we have to make sure is satisfied. Um, so that's why we're only doing scalar multiplication of p2. Um, and then for addition, we have c, okay, so we, if we have one p1 of two is equal to zero and p2, of two is equal to zero, then when we add these, we get zero plus zero, which is equal to zero. So, right, P, um, yeah, P one, two, plus P two, two equals zero. And that would still be within the um, requirement that P two equals zero. I think it's a little clearer if I write it this way. Yeah, so this means that the added two polynomials um, would still satisfy the overall p of 2 equaling 0. So this is true. This is a subspace, so our answer is A. Okay, so in this case we have a differential equation and we're trying to find out what kind of point the origin is. First of all, we can note that this is a linear differential equation. So, for example, you, when you multiply this out, you just get a linear equation, um, as one might expect. A linear differential equation, I should say. Um, and so, from this, we can also write this as x prime equals ax, 
where A is this matrix here and X is this matrix here. And um, one of the reasons that, for example, it's asking about the origin is because in your phase portrait, um, you're going to have when X equals zero and Y equals zero, your like equilibrium solution. So that's why it's talking about the origin. Um, yeah, so what we want to do here is we want to like guess a solution that will satisfy this differential equation. And basically what is most easily to guess is e to lambda t, where lambda is an eigenvalue, um, times some eigenvector, which I'll write like this. So for example, if we plug that into this equation here as our guess for what x is, you get lambda e to the lambda t times eigenvector equals a times e to the lambda t times our eigenvector. Um, also, this is, I guess I'm trying to explain the reasoning behind why we guess this first, just so it's, um, I guess it makes sense why we use this. But you, you don't need to know this for a problem, so I'll get to the actual problem in a few bits. But I think it's kind of important to understand like where the eigenvalues are coming from. And so, anyways, we want this equation to hold for all time t. So no matter what the t is, we want um, this equation to hold. So what we can find is that um, by moving stuff around, and we cancel this because that's just um, uh, a scalar. And so then we have a times this minus lambda times this equals zero, which we can then factor out and do a minus lambda i times this equals zero. Um, and that is actually where we start to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So, right, so we can say that the determinant of a minus lambda one, or i, should be equal to zero. And that's just how we find the eigenvalues. So in this case, um, we can do this, and that our, our, our uh, determinant is four minus lambda times zero, or not zero, what, um, two, three, and five minus lambda. Uh, and this just comes from, right, we do four, two, three, five, minus lambda times the identity matrix, which is just zero, zero, lambda. Uh, and this is where we get this value from. So when I multiply that out, we get uh, four, okay, so four minus lambda times five minus lambda is just 20 minus nine lambda plus lambda squared minus six, oh, minus six, and that should be equal to zero. Um, and we can, get from this lambda squared minus 9 lambda plus 14 equals 0. And when you factor that out, you get lambda minus 7 times lambda minus 2 equals 0. And so then we get that our eigenva uh, eigenvalues are 7 and 2. So from this, you see that these eigenvalues are both greater than 0. So in our solution, e to the lambda t, um, is always going to be growing. So if you imagine this point here, um, your values are always going to be increasing. So in the phase portrait, um, you're going to have something going away from the origin. And this corresponds to a repeller. So that's our answer. In this problem, we have a 2 by 2 matrix A with a given eigenvalue and a corresponding eigenvector. And we're trying to find the real solution for the system that satisfies this differential equation. Um, so recall that if you have uh, a complex eigenvalue and a, consequently a complex eigenvector, that the complex conjugate is also a eigenvalue and eigenvector. So for example, here, um, your second eigenvector would be this and your uh, second, wait, second eigenvalue is this, and your second eigenvector is just the complex conjugate, which would be this. 
And the trick here, I think, that makes this problem a lot easier to solve, though, is to kind of, we don't really need this information because if you have some eigenvector, say V1, um, where it has this real component and a complex component, you can instead write it as, let's just call V1 equals to x1 plus the imaginary value times your x2. And this is actually also a solution to this because if we know that, first of all, if we know that this eigenvector is a solution to this equation, we can plug this in for x. And so we have x1 plus i x2 prime equals a times x1 plus i x2. And if you um, expand this out, and you match the x1 and x2 terms, you get that x1 prime equals ax1 and x2 prime times i equals a times i x2. So from this like quick proof, you can see that x1 and x2 are also solutions to this differential equation system. So that makes our life a lot easier because all we need to do is find the real and um, imaginary component uh, of your solution. <clears throat> so we know that the general solution for this kind of equation is something like some constant times e to the eigenvalue times t times the eigenvector. Um, so this is the eigenvalue one that we get, and then this is going to be our v1. And so we have 1 minus 2i, 3 plus 4i. And then recall Euler's identity. So we can, first we can factor out this e to the t, but then e to the i t is equal to cosine t plus i sine t. And then we have this with our, um, multiply this with our eigenvector, and you can multiply this first on the top and the bottom, right? So we have factor that out, cosine t minus 2i cosine t um, plus, plus 2 sine t. Uh, and then on the bottom we have 3 cosine t plus 4i cosine t um, plus 3i sine t minus 4 sine t. And so when we do that, uh, we can now separate this into the real and imaginary components. So this is real, this is real, uh, this is real, and this is real. So cosine plus t plus 2 sine t 3 cosine t minus 4 sine t. That's a real component. And then um, our imaginary component is this, 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 and this. So we can write that. All right, so this is one solution. Um, this would be, for example, our x1. And then our x2 would then be just factoring out the i. You would have cosine t plus sine t, and then 4 cosine t plus 3 sine t. This is the imaginary component. And we have the e to the t and the e to the t. So these are our two solutions. So we can just have our, um, we can have C1 here and then C2 here as our constants and this will give us our 
um, general real solution for the differential equation. So I should get rid of this here so it's not confusing. But yeah, so then we compare these to our answer choices and uh, it should correspond with A. Yeah. Okay, so in this problem we have P2 being the vector space of polynomials of degree at most 2 and then M2 by 2 is the vector space of all 2 by 2 matrices. We're considering the linear transformation between these two and it's given by this um, matrix. Transformation matrix. So we have, we're trying to find the transformation of AT squared plus BT plus C. So this means from that we can get that PT equals AT squared plus BT plus C. Um, and it's kind of just a plug and chug, I guess. So your transformation of PT is going to be P evaluated at zero. So you just plug in zero for T and you get this is just C. So this is C. And then your other one is P prime of zero at zero. So you take the derivative, right, which is two A T plus B and then plug in zero. So we just get B. So this is B. And then you do the same thing for P1, which gives you um, A plus B plus C. Then P prime at one, so the derivative at T equals one. And you just get two A plus B. Um, so this gives you A plus B plus C on this entry, and then two A plus B at this point. So. This is the final um, transformation uh, matrix that you get. Okay, so now we're trying to find this polynomial such that we get specific values 1, 2, 4, and 4. So we know that from this that we're trying to do C, B, T, uh, A, A plus B plus C, 2A plus b, and we're trying to match this with 1, 2, 4, and 4 for some matrix, or for some with some polynomial that has the form at squared plus bt plus c. Okay, so right either way you can see that c equals 1 and b equals 2 just by matching. So uh, then you can see, plug that into here. And then you see that has to equal 4, so that means a equals 1. And then you can just double check by plugging it in here, and everything should work out. So by plugging those constants in here, we get that the polynomial should be t squared plus 2t plus 1. So that's the polynomial that we should get. And now we're trying to find a basis for the range of t. So the range of the transformation is just the span of the resulting images you get from the transformation. And so, once again, we can look at this here. And I'm going to actually rewrite this as uh, a times 0, 0, 1, 2 plus b times 0, 1, 1, 1 plus c times 1, 0. One zero, and this is just factoring out things and um, adding them together. So this is t. Okay, so remember that the um, input is this polynomial matrix, which is defined by you know a t squared plus b t plus c, and so uh, your a, b, and c are what defines. Um, your result. So when you apply this transformation, um, okay, sorry. So when you apply this transformation, the span is this range of t. So because of that, the basis is really just these three matrices right here, um, because all the outputs will be of some form a times this plus b times this plus c times this because of the input being 
primarily based on A, B, and C on considering how T is defined, right? In terms of P of zero, P of one, and then P prime and stuff like that. So essentially then our basis for this range will be these three matrices. So our basis is zero, zero, one, two, zero, one, 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 and one, zero, one, zero. Basically, um, if it wasn't clear, the basis is going to be, um, so basically if what I didn't say earlier made sense, what I'm trying to say is that um, all the subsequent images from this transformation can be written as a linear combination um, where you can just change your A, B, and C's and that will give you your transformation result. So that's why we can say that these three matrices are going to be the basis for the resulting images. So in this problem, we're trying to find the eigenvalues for this matrix A and the basis for the eigenspace corresponding to these eigenvalues. Okay, so I think we're pretty convinced that we find the determinant by doing A minus, uh, A minus lambda I equals zero. And so that gives us two minus lambda uh, one, negative one, zero, 5 minus lambda, negative 3, 0, 1, 1 minus lambda. Uh, we're trying to find the determinant of this being equal to 0. So I'm just going to do the determinant across this top row right here. So we have 2 minus lambda times. So I don't need to consider the other possibilities because there's just zeros here. So we have this part now and so we do 5 minus lambda times 1 minus lambda plus 3 equal to 0 and now we can simplify this to just be 2 minus lambda times so this is 6 minus uh, 6 lambda plus lambda squared plus 3 or sorry, not, not 6, 5 minus 6 lambda plus lambda squared plus 3, which gives us lambda squared minus 6 lambda plus 8. So we can factor that into lambda minus 4 times lambda minus 2. And now you can see that uh, the eigenvalues are just going to be 2 repeated in 4. So we have this. Um, now what we can do, this is our answer for part one, and then we're also trying to find a basis for the eigenspace. So what that means is we want to find the eigenvectors. So the way we find eigenvectors, right, is by plugging in a minus lambda i times x equals zero and figuring out for what values, um, just picking a value of x that can, um, solve this equation for each of the each of the eigenvalues. So first for lambda equals 2, I'm going to do um, 0, 0, 0, 1, 3, 1, and then negative 3, negative 3, negative 1. And then this equals 0, and I'm just trying to find some x where this is satisfied. So uh, as you can see, um, one example that we could do, we can pick, let's do, you can pick some, right, x1, x2, x3, equals 0, and that's going to be our eigenvector, whatever we choose that satisfies that. So I'm just going to pick, so basically you can kind of expand this out and do row reduction and you can obviously cancel out one of these rows. So, for example, I'll just cancel this row out and just have it all be zeros, right? Because if you just add these two, you get that. Uh, so what you get is x1 um, plus 3x plus x3 equals 0. And um, you can just pick values, but I'm just going to pick... Uh, you could pick anything. You could pick... 
the negative version of what you could do this one or you could do this one um whatever you want but i'm just gonna pick this one uh, as yeah as the choice for this eigenvector so that's one eigenvector but we also know that this is a repeated um a repeated eigenvector so we or eigenvalue so we need to make sure that we have another eigenvector for this value that is literally independent of this first one. So I'm going to call this v1. And the second eigenvector, we have some creative liberty, I guess. So we see that there's a 0 here. So if we wanted to make sure that um, the eigenvectors are independent, we can just pick some eigenvector that has this x3 entry as not being 0. So if I instead make that, say, like 1, um, I can pick like 1, and then I can say, oh, this can be 0, and I'll just make this negative 1 so that equals 0. Alright, so this is my second eigenvector for the repeated root. Um, but yeah, so you could pick any eigenvector you want, but this is just what I'm going to choose. Now you can do the same for lambda equals 4, and that will get you uh, negative 2, 0, 0. 1, 1, 1, 1, negative 1, negative 3, negative, wait, negative 3. Okay. So when you do some row reduction, you can get that this is just 1, and then you can write, you can subtract this from this. And then add this to this, and so these will become zero. And then you can do more row reductions. Add three times this row to this row, and then you can get this one equals zero. So then you've kind of restricted yourself a bit. So from this, we get just to be more clear. You can get one zero 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 one one and zero zero zero. So uh, okay, maybe I should write it as a sign of two, and then a one just to be clear. So, essentially, you know that x1 has to be 0, based on this. Um, and then you have some creative liberty with x2 and x3. So, I, you, it doesn't really matter what you pick, because uh, you would have x2 plus x3 equals 0. So, I'm just going to pick like x2 equals negative 1, x3 equals 1. So, my eigenvector would be 0... Um, negative 1 and 1. So these are my three eigenvectors, and this will be a basis for the eigenspace. So your basis will then be negative 3, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, and 0, negative 1, 1. So this is the basis. Okay. And then we're going to try to find an invertible matrix P and a diagonal matrix D such that this is satisfied. So, um, first of all, we can remember that P is a matrix of eigenvectors. So the columns of P will be the eigenvectors of your matrix A originally. And the same, similar thing with D where you have the eigenvalues are on the diagonal and then everything else is zero. And th these uh, two matrices should correspond um, in terms of which eigenvalue corresponds to which uh, eigenvector. So recall that this matrix corresponds to the A matrix up here. And so we can have in this as A. Um, and so you can write basically that A, P equals... Um, D. And basically this just means that for all the columns, so if I write P as P1, P1, P2, dot, oh, I guess there's only three, so there's just three. And then I can write also D as first eigenvalue, second eigenvalue, and third eigenvalue. These are all zeros. Alright, so what I'm essentially saying is that A times P1 
if I expand this out. equals lambda 1 times p1, lambda 2 times p2, and lambda 3 times p3. Yeah, so as you can see here, this is, if you like match these columns, um, this is exactly how you would have your original form of an eigenvalue, right? So you'd have something like this. But instead here we just expand it because we have this invert this matrix P which the columns P1, P2, P3 are correspond to the eigenvectors. And so we're really doing the same thing, we're just writing it in a different way. Anyway, so because we know our eigenvectors from above, we can write them as uh what were they? Okay, so our eigenvectors are negative three one zero and negative one zero one and zero negative one one. So we can put this into our P matrix. We can do this, like 1, 3, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 1. So this can be P. And we also want to have our diagonal matrix D such that uh, each column corresponds to the um, eigenvalue that the eigenvector is is calculated from. So for example, negative 3, 1, 0 um, came from a lambda of 2. This came from also lambda 2. And then this also, this came from lambda 4. So then we can just literally write it down as 2, 2, 4, and do this. So you can actually check this if you wanted to. Um, what you can do this is kind of a tangent now, but this is um, an answer. But what you can do to check your answer is find the inverse of P. So the way you do that is by putting in this matrix, right? Um, and then having on this side. This is one way to do it, but you can do other ways to find the inverse. But you do this, you row reduce until everything here is an identity matrix form, um, like this. And then this, whatever is here, is your P inverse. And then you can actually do this multiplication P D times P inverse to check that this is in fact the A, vat, A matrix that you get. Um, also, it doesn't really matter obviously what order you do it in. Uh, for example, if you have 2, 4, 2, or 4, 2, 2, as long as these eigenvector eigenvalues correspond to the eigenvector. So for example, like this must correspond with this eigenvalue. So that's why we must have it in this order. Um, so if you if you put it for example as zero negative one one and negative one zero one negative three one zero your if this was your p instead your diagonal matrix needs to be um, four two two instead of two two four these are all zeros so yeah uh, this is our answer. Okay, so in this question, we're trying to find the eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors. So we've kind of already done this before. So I'll just kind of gloss through it. So we're trying to find the determinant of lambda a minus lambda i equaling 0, which basically means 9 minus lambda, 5, negative 6, negative 2 minus lambda equals 0. And then we're going to solve for lambda. So we get um, negative 18 minus 7 lambda plus lambda squared plus 30 and plus 0 and then you get lambda squared minus 7 lambda plus 12 um, equals 0 and then that you can factor into lambda minus 4 times lambda minus 3 and this means that you get eigenvalues of 4 and 3. Once again, to find the eigenvectors, you want to find what value would satisfy this expression for each of the eigenvalues that you've calculated. So in this case, we for the third, the eigenvalue of 3, 
we get 6, 5, negative 6, negative 5 um, equals 0 time, uh, times some x equals 0. So obviously if you reduce, you can just make this 0. And I'm just going to pick, right, if you write this out, it's a 6 times x, 6 times x, 1, plus 5 times x, 2, equals 0. So we just choose some x that will satisfy this, and that's our eigenvector. So I'm just going to um, pick negative 5 and 6, uh, but you could alternatively do, for example, like 5, negative 6. Um, I'll, just, I'll just stick with this one, actually. So... Now, that's our first eigenvector that corresponds to lambda of 3. And then we do the same thing for the one that's 4. And we do, we do 4, uh, you get 5, 5, negative 6, negative 6, 0, 0. And then again, you can row reduce, this becomes 0. And then you have something like 5x1 plus 5x2 equals 0. And then you can just pick your eigenvector to be, um, say, like 1, negative 1. And that's the corresponding eigenvector for um, a eigenvalue of 4. So I'll just make it clear that these are connected. So that's our answer for part A. Uh, and then for part 2, we have find the general solution to the system of differential equations. Um, which has the same a as up here. All right, so the what we generally guess for this kind of solution is something like e to the lambda t times the corresponding eigenvector. So we already have our lambdas and we have our eigenvalues in our eigenvectors, so we can just plug it in. So we have e times right. Okay, so we have e times lambda one t with some constant up ahead times v1 plus c2 times e to the lambda 2 t times v2 and we just plug in and so we get c1 e to the 3 t times 5 negative 6 plus c2 e to the 4 t times 1 negative 1 um, and this is going to be equal to um, our x and y. And this is our general solution. And again, it doesn't matter which eigenvalue or vector you pick. So like we could have done, you know, negative 5 plus 6 instead. Um, but I'm going okay, to erase that just so it doesn't get confusing. But all that changes would, would be like a constant out front, which would be like affecting the c1. So as long as your eigenvector satisfies uh, the equation, so like for example this equation and this equation, then you sh it doesn't matter um, exactly where your eigenvector is. So in the last part we're trying to find a particular solution. So we know that x of 0 equals 1 and y of 0 equals 0. And so what you can do is you can just plug in um, x of 0 and y of 0 into this and that should equal 1, 0. And this will allow us to find um, c1 and c2. So uh, t equals 0, this e to the 3t becomes 1. So we just have 5 to the negative 6, uh, 5 and negative 6, plus c2 times 1, negative 1. And you basically have a system of equations now, um, which right you have 5c1 plus c2 equals 1 and then negative 6c1 minus c2 equals 0. So if you solve this you'll get that c1 equals negative 1 and c2 equals 6. So then what we want to do is we can just plug it into our x. So x of t is oops, now given by c1 times e to the 3t times 5 plus c2 times e to the 4t times 1. Um, so if we put in uh, t equals 1, and we also have these known, we get um, x of t is equal to negative 5 times e to the 3 plus 6 times e to the 4th. 
And then for y1, I should say that this is x1 and y1. The same thing, but obviously you use the bottom row, which is um, c1 times negative 6 e to the 3t plus minus c2 e to the 4t. Um, oh yeah, okay, so then we can plug in c1 equals negative 1 and c2 equals 6 and we get and then t equals 1 and we get 6 times e to the 3 um, minus 6 times e to the 4 so then we add these two up to get x1 x yeah x1 plus y1 and then we get um, e to the 3 which is our answer